recording. Welcome back, everybody, to the second segment of Living Jewishly. This is the Parsha Review. This week's Parsha is Parsha Tetzavet, the eighth portion in the book of Exodus, and the 20th portion since the beginning of the Torah. We have 101 verses, 1,412 words, and 5,430 letters. There is no extra letter in the Torah. There are eight, seven commandments in this week's Torah portion, four, four performative, and three prohibitions. I, I am correcting my previous uh, things that I said prohibitive, because the actual translation of tr- prohibitive doesn't mean what I thought it meant. Prohibitive just means that something's blocking you from doing it, which really is God telling you not to do it. But a prohibition means God is commanding you not to do it. So it's, which is why I changed it now to. Uh, One's an ounce, the other's a ver- uh, an adjective. There you go. So this is, again, these last five portions of Teruma, Tzave, Kisisa, Vayakon, Pekude, the last five portions in the book of Exodus are dealing with the building of the tabernacle. This one specifically, like last week's Torah portion, is dealing with Moshe getting the instructions. And now more detailed than that is the priestly garments. Last week was talking about, if you remember, we mentioned last week was the structure and the vessels. This time, this parsha is dealing with the priestly garments. So this is the humanly side of the tabernacle. Last time was the structure, but now it's the human aspect of it. So Hashem instructs Moshe on how to design the big day kahuna, the priestly vestments. The small kohen, meaning the simple kohen, had four garments that they wore, while the kohen gadol, the high priest, he had eight vestments, eight garments that he wore. The hat, I, I did them from head to toe so that it will be easier. The hat, the head plate, the head plate which said Kodesh La Hashem, which is holy to Hashem, the robe, the breastplate, the coat, the apron, the belt, and the linen trousers. I promise that I'm getting that book. I ordered them. They should be here tomorrow. Yes? I read this many times, but I've never seen where they said the small Korean had four garments, and I don't know what the garments are. Right, so he the four... four Garments of the small Kohen were just simple, regular, like a simple hat. He had a simple uh, uh, trousers, and and it was it was a it was a four basic, basic right? Exactly. I think he had he had like trousers, the jacket, a belt, and a hat. I think. Okay. So what are the garments? So the turban, the crown, the robe, the breastplate, the tunic the pants, the belt, and the earphone. So what, so this I found um, in preparation for this, this week, I found different sources for the, what each of these represented and what they were a, an atonement for. When the Kohen wore these garments, they were an atonement for the people. In that generation, it was an atonement that you have to understand what was going on in the temple. The temple was not just a place where there was uh, they were slaughtering animals and you know singing songs. This was the this is the epicenter of the world. This is where um, the 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 physical resting place of God in this world is. Right when the temple w- was destroyed, and why do we mourn the? It's a building. It's 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 a it's an edifice. What's the big deal? We don't mourn any building. Yes, yeah, September 11th. So September 11th will be a day of mourning for some time until uh, people say, okay, let's move on, right? We remember it. We were alive, right? My children have no idea. They don't have any way to connect to it. Okay, there's a building of fell. So there's another building in its place. Or there isn't. It, it doesn't, it, it's so insignificant to people. So why is the temple still being mourned today 2,000 years later, where every single night of Av, we mourn the destruction of the temple. Because it wasn't just a building. It, were, it was a representation of God resting amongst us. That's what it was. It was far greater than just being a building. 
And that's why we mourn that because we want that. We want God in our midst. It says in the Talmud that every generation in which the temple is not rebuilt, it's as if it was destroyed in that generation. That's what the Talmud says, right? So in any generation that the temple is not being rebuilt, this year, if it's not being rebuilt, it was destroyed in this year. Because we didn't have enough merits to bring it back. It's a very powerful uh, lesson for us. So each part of the the Kohen's involvement in the temple was very significant. All of the different, uh, all of the different, um, all of the different garments that he wore were significant. The prayers that were said were significant. They all had very profound impact on every. By the way, the Sanhedrin, which was the high high court of the Jewish people, met in the courtyard of the temple. Now, today, again, we don't have the Sanhedrin because we don't have a temple. The Rambam, interestingly, the Rambam wanted to be buried in Tiberias. Why in Tiberias? Because the Rambam wrote the book of all Jewish law. And he felt like he wants to be in the place where the Sanhedrin are going to reunite. The Talmud says that the place in which the, Tal- the Sanhedrin are going to reunite is going to be Tiberius. He wants to be buried in Tiberius so that he can be there with... Yeah, it's an amazing thing. Now, where was the Rambam... Where did he pass away? In, in yeah, Egypt. Egypt. Yeah. In Egypt. And they say that his, his, uh, the donkey that he was carrying him, his coffin, ran away from the procession. They were, they were escorting his body ran away from the procession with the Rambam tied onto the donkey and ran all the way to Tiberius. Mm-hmm. Knew to what its destination was. Mm-hmm. And that's where I got to go. I was paid. My Uber says to go to Tiberius. <laughs> I'm going to Tiberius. Right? That's a long way. <laughs> it's a long way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All the way to Tiberius because that's where the Rambam needed to be buried. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, so the, tur- the turban worn on the head was an atonement for haughtiness. Someone raises their head up. They feel like they're right. Again, the crown as well atones for arrogance. The robe atones for evil speech. Now, I don't know why. I don't know why each thing, right? The head one makes makes sense. Yeah. The robe, I, I don't understand why it's for evil speech. The breastplate atones for errors of judgment. That we do know. It's called the Choshen Hamishpat. It was the, the you know that you know how the breastplate worked? Yeah. yeah. Right? They would ask questions and different letters of the names of Ruven, Shimon, Levi, Yehudi, Sach, Zvulun, Dan, Naftali, God, Asher, Yosef, and Binyamin. They're all the letters of the alphabet. The letters would light up and they would be able to see the answers to their questions. Mm-hmm. Right? It was. It, than a magic <laughs> they didn't have the high priest did have to use some judgment as to what the words actually mean. Right. That's why he screwed up a crown. What was that? I didn't know what he explained it to him about Hana and the the lights on the breastplate. So it says with with Hana when she was praying, she was begging for a child. She was begging. Eli Hakoin for a child. Please, I want a child. So, what was the word that was actually? It came out. He interpreted it as drunk. Right, 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 right. But what is what was the word? I'm trying to think the it word in Hebrew. Uh, it's a Talmud in. It's a Talmud in. In. Um, so, so she was praying. Honest. It was uh, honest or sincere or something like that. Is what the other word would be if you put the right. Correct. So, right, so, so it's a Talmud in Lamed Aleph, uh, Amud Aleph in 31a in Tractate Berchot, where she went to Elia Cohen and she said, give me a bracha. See, he says to her, having had this revelation, he said to her, what are you coming to me? You're drunk. Because he read the words. He, 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 not that he read it wrong, but, he, but it really meant that she was serious and she was genuine. Right, is the same word that could be. Where, where is the where is the word? Well, 
<laughs> right. <laughs> but it's, it's, but it, it's the it's the it, 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 right. right. So so um, yeah, but she ended up having Samuel. Samuel yeah, yeah. was considered to be greater than Moses and Aaron. Very 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 incredible. See the way. That's by the way why how we learn how we learn to say the Amidah silently. We say the Amidah silently. We learn that from Hannah. Because she was saying words and he couldn't hear what she was saying. So he thought, to her, what type of drunken comes to speak to me like this? So she's mumbling words that nobody can hear. And we learned this from Hannah, that that's the proper way to speak. Because she was talking from her heart. Okay. Okay, so the breastplate atones for the errors of judgment. The tunic, which covers most of the priest's bodies, atones for killing. The pants atone for sexual transgressions. The belt wound about the body and worn over the heart atones for sins of the heart, improper thoughts. So the, the belt was a very long belt. It wasn't just a belt like, yeah. you know, we have a belt. It fits the right, the right size and that's it, you know. I don't know. It was a belt that was wound about um, so it would cover more than just, you know, the waist. And then the ephod atones for the for idolatry. Okay, just interesting uh, that there's nothing which is just random. We, we think that this is like, okay, it's nice to have these garments. But they were really atoning for any sin that the Jewish people of the time. Now, there's a very interesting law. Very, very interesting law. There's an entire tractate in Talmud dedicated, dedicated to this. What happens if someone kills somebody else by mistake? Then they go to the... Um, they go to yeah, the city of refuge. refuge. Mm -hmm. So imagine someone's going up a ladder, or uh, actually going down a ladder, and falls. And falls on somebody else, the person dies. Okay, so what happens? The person has to run to a city of refuge because the people who are related to that deceased person can come and kill him. And the city of refuge was like, was like a self-imprisonment. He'd stay there, and when would he be freed? When the high priest died. When the high priest died. So what would the mother of the high priest do? She would yeah. go to the city of refuge and she would feed the people there and she would give them clothes, nice clothes. And she would, why was she doing that? She doesn't want her son to be killed. They're all going to pray to say, Hashem, please, the Kohen Gadol should just die already. We want to go back to our families. Please let us out of prison, right? We want to just go. It's like this, they'd be appeased. And they were like, oh, yeah, it's nice to have nice cooked <laughs> meals. And, and, you know, she'd feed them and she'd dress them nicely. And that way they wouldn't pray. So the question is, is asked so many times. It's like, who are you worried about these guys? These guys are murderers. And by the way, they're not only that. They're also people who killed, but you don't have testimony right. to... To, right, so it would also be like, like it would be like a, it would be a prison, right? If you didn't have someone, we know that someone died, but we didn't have enough proof. He didn't have two witnesses, right? Yeah, right, whatever it was, they didn't have enough to put the guy to death, so he would also go to prison. He would go to this uh, city of refuge. So, right, so these are the guys you're worried about. That's gonna pray. These, these, they all have blood on their hands, and these are the guys you're afraid they're going to pray to God, and that's going to be our sages tell us, yes, because all prayer has tremendous power. Even from the lowest places, mm -hmm. from the lowest people, murderers has tremendous power. You have to be very, very careful. Prayer is very, very powerful. Okay? Not only careful, you have to know for yourself that prayer has tremendous power. So Hashem tells Moshe to command the Jewish people to supply pure olive oil for the menorah in the Mishkan and for the, in the Mishkan in the tent of meeting. Now, it's important for us to, to, to just point out why olive oil? Why olive oil? There's plenty of other types of oil. Because olive oil represents the Jewish people. Sadly. You see, 
how do you get the oil out of the olive? Press. Press you got to press it. You got to smash it in order to get something good out of it. Mm-hmm. The Jewish people, sometimes the only way for them to go and understand the right way, to understand the proper way to conduct themselves, you have to beat them to a pulp. <laughs> right? You have to <laughs> smash them. Oppressive. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. You have to smash them. And that's when, if you realize that when the Jewish people, well, what happened? We're going to have soon, we're going to have the, the, the celebration, right? In a month, we're going to have the celebration of Purim. Mm-hmm. And what's good, what happens in Purim? Everyone gets happy and drunk. But what happened in the story of Purim? Okay. The Jewish people were on the verge of annihilation. On the verge of annihil- annihilation, and that turned them all around. They were pressed like a like like a like a um, like a like an olive, and only then the finest, the purest, comes out. So when we see olive oil in the Hanukkah menorah, we see the olive, we always see olive oil. It's always to remind us: don't wait to get smashed to be to be be pure and good. What? To get smashed. To get, to get, to, oh, very good, very good. <laughs> Don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) Upon upon their completion, Moshe is to perform a ceremony for several days to consecrate Aaron and his sons. So as soon as they're done with all of the garments, Moshe now is going to perform. This didn't happen yet, but he will go and perform a ceremony which will be a seven-day consecration of, of Aaron and his sons including offering sacrifices, dressing Aaron and his sons in their respective garments, and anointing Aaron with oil. There would be a special oil, Shemin Amishcha, that would, that would be poured onto Aaron's head and would, would uh, roll down his, down his body. Um, That's not all the oil used for that? It, yeah, but it was a certain mixture of things that, that, that went with it. Hashem commands that a daily morning and afternoon offering should be brought with the sheep on the altar in the Mishkan. The Mishkan is the tabernacle, right? This offering should be accompanied by a meal offering and libation of wine and oil. So there was always mixtures. Now, the mixtures, I don't know so much about. I don't understand, meaning I don't understand their, but they also have, there's something to it. There's something to, I'll give you an example. Um, there are many people who have the custom that before they make Kiddush on Shabbos, they rinse out their their Kiddush cup. They rinse it out so that it's clean and they make sure that there's no, right? But then they take three drops of water from their cup that's left in there, like little, you know, this little residue of the water that you just rinsed out the cup with. And they put three drops of water into the wine before they pour the wine into their into their glass. Why? Because red wine represents judgment. White water represents kindness. Mm -hmm. So before you pour judgment into your cup, you want to mix it with kindness. So much logic. Judaism is so full of logic. It's amazing. But it's, you understand, it's It's like, is that, I'm sure you've seen it at, at, uh, at Danny's house. You've never seen her do it? Well, yeah, I'm sure he does. So they'll, they'll, they'll pour it. either three. Some people do three. Some people just do one big flow or like, you know, just a little uh, something. But um, th- again, that's the idea is that there's, there's something to it. We don't understand maybe all the details of, of what it is. We definitely don't. Um, also, all of the mixtures of the ingredients of the different, there's, at the end of our prayer every day, there is <clears throat> so in Ashkenaz we don't have this, but in, in the Safar should have I have I have a Safar to here. Can't find it right now, but um, there's something which is called korbanot, which is the offerings, and they recite all the offerings. I'll tell you just a very funny story. Anybody here familiar with Rabbi Yakovian? We're all familiar with Rabbi Yakovian. He's fantastic. 
So um, the the uh, all of the different ingredients that they would put in into the offerings. So anybody know what samim is? Samim is different mixtures of of uh, of ingredients or medicines. It's called the sam. Is 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 right? But some of those mixtures would be would be those potions would be healing would have healing healing powers. So either way, but in the modern day of Hebrew, samim is also used as drugs, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Socher samim is someone who's a drug dealer. Right, but because Rabbi Yakobin is as awesome as he is, so in his shul with all of his Israelis fired up, so whenever he gets to the word samim, they all go samim. Right, that it becomes like a whole right, <laughs> whole yes. salute. So either way, so one of his students was introduced to religious life here in Houston in the synagogue. And uh, got very involved and became completely Shomer Shabbos. But this is the only synagogue he's ever known. And he goes to Israel for his first visit to see his family. And he goes to the synagogue. Yeah. And they say the Karbanot. And when the rabbi gets to Sami, he starts yelling, Sami! And he had no idea what they were talking about. Like, everyone looks at him, he's says, crazy. And he comes back, he's like, Rabbi, what'd you do to me? He's like, this is wherever I went, they thought I was crazy. Right? Yeah. But that's uh, uh, Rabbi Yacobian. A uh, great sense of humor, but but all of these all of these ingredients, the different mixtures of them, had different different powers. Um, that them coming together would bring together, you know, the the awesome healing abilities and whatever other um, aspects of this world needed to come together in in the perfection of the service in the temple. Hashem commands to. Uh, that another altar of incense be built from acacia wood covered with gold. And where did that acacia wood co- come from? Anybody knows where that came from? Egypt. Where in Egypt? The, the trees that were planted by, uh, was it Reuben who went down first? Right. And what, 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 who brought them? Who brought them to, to, to the desert? Well, Moses. Moses. Moses, very good. Yeah. Moses, when everybody was busy getting the Rolexes, and the Louis Vuitton bags, right? <laughs> and everyone was saying, let's go, pay up. I worked for you for 210 years as a slave. Now it's time to pay up, right? And the Egyptians gave them, just go, just go, take it, go, go. <clears throat> so Moshe didn't do that. Moshe did two other jobs. He went to get the bones of Joseph, and he cut down the acacia trees so that he can bring them for the, for the future building of the temple. <laughs> Okay. Trees, What's that? They were very big trees, yeah. They were very big trees. Well, very strong. Years old. That's right. And <laughs> well, the people slept them. We, we, we don't even have a we don't even have a clue. We don't even have a clue to fathom what transpired in the Exodus of Egypt. They had these eighteen wheelers with flatbeds. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They're the truckers in Canada. They're all the and truckers there, in Canada. I read a midrash somewhere that said that the individual uh, the children of Israel each had ninety-six donkeys right. that were loaded down with with. The you heard that here first, right? With the booty, with the booty. Yeah. Yeah. That's each individual. That's well, right. We're talking about, about that a long time ago. Yeah, we're yeah. talking about they, there was over six hundred thousand. Males between 20 and 60. That means it's 3.2 million, million people. Million people, right? Millions of people. We figured out it was it, it, million donkeys. Yeah. We figured it out. Really? Wow. That's a lot of donkeys, guys. <laughs> a lot of donkeys. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of donkeys. Really fast than I did. <laughs> <laughs> right. he did it He's good with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it is. It is just. It, it's. It's breathtaking to imagine. Now. I think it's important for only one reason. There's zero accuracy in the Ten Commandments movie. <laughs> but there's zero accuracy. But I think just to get an idea before Pesach, to just sit and watch the splitting of the sea. Uh-huh. Because it can, at least in our mind, by the way, they say that there's different opinions. But every opinion, there's no opinion that says that it just opened up into one lane. No. 
lanes. There's no lanes. either each either that it was twelve lanes or that it was for each individual yeah. their own lane. It's like the Katy Freeway, twelve lanes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it hits a lot faster. Exactly, and there's no VIP or uh, HOV. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I, I, I've got seven kids. I'm like, they're like, well, I have 12 kids, okay? <laughs> it, it wasn't zero accuracy. It did take place in Egypt. Uh, that, that, that is true. How long did it take to pull those donkeys together? It was a massive, massive exodus. You, 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 it's like, like three years to get all those donkeys. Who was taken? And then the Egyptians were running after them. Who followed behind cleaning up after the donkeys? Well, guess what? But imagine why Moshe had to hold up his, his hands for so long. <laughs> right so it, it took some time it wasn't just like guys let's go right it, it, it wasn't like that and plus they're jews they're saying one second did we leave something did you short did you check did you check under the beds did you check what was someone or someone run back someone run back <laughs> you sure you took the charger usually god contracts distances for us like he did for eliezer you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So that the, look, and not only that, the Jewish people didn't end up leaving then. They came back around. So if you if you if you look at what the map was, okay, they, have it. They, have, they might have it here. Yeah, I think it's the Jewish people didn't even end up leaving Egypt. Right. They came around the circle. They came around in a circle. They came right back to Egypt. But because the Egyptians didn't believe that they were coming back, God said, we'll be back in three days. Three-day break, then we're coming back. They didn't believe us. They ran after us. That's when we, we were set free. We came back, and then we went out. It's uh, unbelievable. But that's why that the Halacha tells us, and we say this every year on Pesach, the more you talk about the Exodus from Egypt, the more you read about it, the more you learn about it, the more more blessed you'll feel. The better you'll feel, the more you because the more you know, it's like this is unreal. And this was so done for us. The Jews left and did a U turn and came back to Egypt. God said, Right. Around. Yeah, this, they, they were, they, because God said we're going to be back in three days. Why? We came back in three days. But why did God want to back? There. Probably to test the Egyptians to see if they were if they were willing. Uh, God could have taken us out without any miracles. I mean, without That's the right. Ten Commandments, right. without any of it, right? Without the Ten Commandments, right. without the Ten Plagues, right? God could have taken us out without all the big the big hype. So why why was that necessary? It was to strengthen the Jewish people's faith and belief in Hashem. That each one of those uh, each one of those plagues was another opportunity for the Jews to see as exactly was predicted by Hashem to Moshe, to the Jewish people, that exactly at this minute, the water is going to turn into blood. Exactly at this minute. And to, for the, each one represents different, a different part of God's abilities. These are all the waters. These are all the, all the sand, which is the lice, right? The, 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 uh, the firstborn, every single neshama, Every single soul, God turns on and off when God wants. And everything is in God's power. That was the idea of all the ten, uh, ten, ten plagues. By the way, each of them, if you remember when we did the uh, breakneck through the Bible, we, we, we matched. We have to finish it up. Whenever you guys are ready. <laughs> You're doing fine with this. You're like this way you'll actually finish the Torah. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> We finished Leviticus. We never finished Numbers. Yeah, we were numbers, exactly. No, no, no. We're in the we're deep in the middle of Numbers someplace. Someplace. No, we were in Leviticus. Mine is still in Leviticus. Mine is still in Leviticus. Yeah, one more. I have no numbers, but either way. So the, we never celebrated finishing Leviticus. You were supposed to go to Ed's house. <laughs> that, that may have been where Genesis was moving. <laughs> so the okay, so that that's that. Now on last week's on last week's uh, something that we did not finish up on last week, we finished, but I I wasn't clear enough on. I re reworked the notes from last week. That's so much free time, everybody. Yeah. What's that? You have so much free time to rework the notes. Well, I was sick in bed for almost a week, so I had some time to uh, 
so okay so we said what was inside the ark right, right. so yeah. the tablets the tablets the ten commandments that moshe brought down the broken pieces of the first set of tablets the a torah scroll and a pitcher of mana and aaron's miraculous staff were placed right in front of the ark those were in front of the in ark. front of the ark the last two or just the that's what it says the last two you wrote or just the staff which was in front of the ark the staff the, the it, apparently the a pitcher of mana so like one in front pitch, or inside? in front that's what it says hmm. and and the miraculous staff were placed in front of it so but there's another thing is that it says that the everybody wanted to carry the ark when they were traveling everybody wanted to carry it it was like everybody wanted why because it said that the our own the the ark carried its carriers right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. it was no says no self you came to carry it it carried you so our say just tell us an amazing thing you know my grandfather I'll tell it to you by way of this. My grandfather, when I would walk home from shul with him in the morning, every day. So he, my grandfather was in his 80s. And he'd walk home slowly, holding his tefillin. So I said, Saba, I'll hold your tefillin. He would say, no, 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 no. The Aron, the Ark, carried its carriers. That's, that was his answer. What, what was he saying? He's it's saying the tefillin is carrying me. I'm not carrying the tefillin. The tefillin are carrying me. That was just an amazing answer. Ara no says no self. The tefillin are carrying me. But our sages tell us also is an amazing thing. That sometimes we have opportunities to do acts of kindness, to do uh, acts of charity, and we think like we're doing the biggest favor to to the people. Yeah. I'm doing them a favor. Look at me. I'm being so, so, I'm being so, so kind. I'm being so generous. I'm being so, and really, it's exactly the opposite. It's the it's it's the opportunity to give. I think that that's the reason I'm feeling better. I'm serious. Yesterday, I was like, I felt like I was dead. Okay, I was like feeling so bad. It was and. Yaakov was teaching the class for me, and I thank him tremendously for doing that. He was teaching the class for me, and I had to produce the class. So there's someone in the back, and when you have so many people, so you don't hear bing, 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 every person who comes into the class, and there's almost 50 people in the class, mm-hmm. imagine you have them, and he'd have to admit every person into the room. Oh, okay. If it's a small, smaller class, it's fine, but this, it's a big class. So I had to do it in the back end and then record it and do the whole the whole thing uh, for him. And I'm, I was like feeling so awful. And and Zahava wasn't feeling us. I told her, you go lay down with the kids. I have to produce this anyway for Yaakov. I'm going to be sitting there. And as all this is happening, my daughter comes to me. And she says, someone here, someone is here to collect charity. I was like, I'm in pajamas. Okay. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm like, send them in, send them in, right? Because, and I, of course, and he walked in, I said, listen, I'm not feeling well, I'm sorry, but I'm so happy that you're here mm-hmm. because who knows if you didn't just bring me the opportunity for healing. Mm-hmm. Right? I think like, oh, I'm doing him a big favor. I'm giving him charity. No, no, no. He's doing me the favor, bringing me the mitzvah mm-hmm. that can help, that can heal me. Mm-hmm. And many times people think like, I'm doing them the favor. And I, it's funny because I'm the one who's, usually soliciting people for gifts, right? Wait till next week, right? <laughs> next week is the campaign, right? Yeah. But but the truth is that that's the way it really is, right? I'll tell you something amazing. I've said this just a few weeks ago in our... Did I? Yeah, I did. Right? I'll, just, I'll, I'll tell it to you outside. We're basically... The the Rabbeinu Bachia, who's the Chovot Halavavot, right? Which you're learning, right? Yeah. You know, the Shara Bitachon. Uh-huh. So the Rabbeinu Bachia writes in the introduction to, I don't remember, either Kitetze, Kitavo, 
one of the portions in in Deuteronomy. He writes as an introduction. He says, just know that when someone knocks on your door to ask you for charity, it's not them. It's God. It's God coming in a disguise of this person and testing you to see your your willingness. And by the way, you should just know, I, I'm sure there are people who are giving this person who came to me last night much more money. Much more money than I'm giving him. But I don't know if there's anyone who's doing it with the amount of love, maybe, who's doing it with <laughs> for feeling sick, right? Mm-hmm. And have every excuse. I really do. I had every excuse in the world. I really, I, I was happy that he was there. I was schmoozing with him, talking with him. You know, he was seeing Yaakov teaching. And he's like, I don't understand. It's like, these people are just coming to learn Torah? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. So it's like I said, yeah, and I'll show you if you want. I have a camera right there, right? right? That you can see in, in the room also. You know, it's like, like this is this is real. We, Torah is being taught in Houston, Texas. It's not only in Brooklyn, New York, right? <laughs> so people from Brooklyn, New York, they think that's... Well, that's because that's they a, think they're... That's, they're, the, that's the center of the universe. They think they're the center of the universe. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So, uh, uh, that's right. It is. It is. I will tell you though, my grandfather, when I got my uh, my rabbinic ordination in Jerusalem, and I had they made a goodbye party for me when I was leaving and uh, moving to uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. <laughs> so, that's pretty, that's pretty different. Isn't it? Oh yeah. So my grandfather came to the to the to the to the celebration. I begged him to come, and he came. It was a very big thing. And uh, he said, he had no visions of going to, to Texas, like nothing. He wasn't even, I was going to Bridgeport, Connecticut, and that was, you know. And my grandfather said, I want you all to know, because the whole, the kolel that I, you know what a kolel is? The kolel is a yeshiva for married men. It's not, it's a regular yeshiva for married men, and some calls are specific. You know, you go to a specific school of medicine, right? It's a specific school. So you can go for rabbinic school, right? You can go to many different ones. One that'll be, teach you how to be a rabbi who can give a, a, a get, and a rabbi who can teach you how to, you know, rule certain rulings regarding uh, laws of uh, Shabbos or whatever it is. So our school was teaching you basically all the laws of the rabbinate, right? So any law that comes up, one of the rabbis in our call should be able to answer at any given moment. Laws of uh, family purity, laws of kosher, laws of this, laws of that. We should we should be able to uh, handle it, uh, right? Now, if you don't review it, you can forget it, right? Like anything, like in medicine, you can forget it also. You can see doctors who don't know what to tell you on anything, right? Because they haven't reviewed it for a long time. Not you, Howard. <laughs> so, so my grandfather said, he says, I want you to know that each of you going out there, you're going out to teach Torah to the world. So I want you to know that you are partners with Mashiach. You are partners with Mashiach. And if I had strength and I was only 20 years younger, so my grandfather says, I would even go out to Texas to teach Torah. <laughs> he said that. My, my rabbi is there. My rabbi remembers it. I asked my rabbi, I said, is that my imagination? Did he actually say that? He said, yeah, he said that. And it was about 11 months later that I was living in Texas already. <laughs> That's uh, prophetic. <laughs> but, uh, that was that was mid-September. By August already, I was in Houston. Good time to come. Yeah, I came. <laughs> I, yeah, so we're I, going to change that. Yeah. Houston, Texas. That's what. Houston, Texas. Texas. So actually, when I got my third rabbinic ordination from the chief rabbi of Israel, that's exactly what he said. That verse, Ki mitzion teitzet Torah, with var Hashem Yerushalayim. And the Torah shall, shall spread, spread forth from Jerusalem. Yeah. Right? All right, my dear friends, have a terrific evening. Thank you very much. Thank Everyone you. feel good. Have a good Shabbos. So what was your sickness about? Why are you sick for a whole week? You know? I, I, I tested negative for COVID. So <laughs> I don't know if that is in his case. It's winter. He's got the flu. He had a cold. Yeah.
Yeah. It was more than just the cold because it was. Yeah. I know this was asked a long time ago. You said you wanted to have a little bit of a I think only the Levites did. Only the Levites? I believe so. Yeah. Except when, 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 when